welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim and Rishon here together with Yitzhak Muvain. And today, the third day of the month of Tevet, 5780, it is the 30th of December. 31st. 31st of December, 2019. Wake up, Rabbi. The year's almost over. Sorry, I was thinking about the third of Tevet. And this week, Parshat... Vayigash, thank you for that cor- correction, Yitzchak. I don't know where my head was. Obviously not in December. But in the month of Teve, it's spelled Tet Tov, which the root of which obviously is Tov. Um, strange month, the month of Teve, that we have just begun, in which we are now on the third day of. Strange in that it is, the, it is exceptional. <laughs> it is the only month on the Hebrew calendar which begins in the middle of a holiday, it began on the at the end the end days of Hanukkah, and so this is really interesting actually, because we, you know we always go with these life lessons of the calendar, and uh, everybody knows this month of Kislev that we just concluded was totally focused on the Beit Hamikdash, on the Holy Temple, the major theme of the month of Kislev, the the hidden light of creation and releasing that light and the rededication of the Holy Temple in the time of the Chashmonaim from the defilement of the Greeks and the whole deal with um, the focal point of Kislev being the rededication of the Temple, and then in the waning days of Hanukkah, the month of Tevet begins. And it's interesting because there's a certain, certain kind of turnabout in the month of Tevet. And again, I emphasize that the root of the word Tevet is uh, Tetbet, which is Tov, which is good. The thing turnabout, though, is that, in other words, we continue with the focus on the Holy Temple, on Holy Temple consciousness, uh, at the head of our consciousness in the calendar. We continue with that. But it changes in the month of Tevet, and it becomes more somber. Uh, it becomes more bleak. It becomes tinged with sorrow because the main characteristic of the month of Tevet are three days. The eighth, ninth, and tenth of Tevet, the crescendo being the tenth of Tevet, which is going to, which is a fast day that is observed next week, uh, next Tuesday, and that day commemorates the siege <coughs> that was uh, made against Jerusalem in the time of the first temple by King Nebuchadnezzar of Bavel, of Babylon, which led later in the month of Tammuz to the breaching of the wall around Jerusalem and ultimately to the destruction of the temple. So in other words, yes, we continue in this month with the obsession, as it were, with Holy Temple consciousness, which we began in a light-filled um, way in Kislev, right? And we continue with the, with that in the month of Tevet, but it's changed. It's muted. It is um, it is about the beginning of a of a cycle of four fasts. So the thing is, you know, we're never far from the Holy Temple in our in our minds and our hearts and our souls. And this is in itself a, it's a it's a beautiful thing because what I'm saying is we measure time according to the Holy Temple. I mean, didn't we tell you that we start praying for rain in the month of Cheshvan on the day when all the holiday pilgrims have made it safely home, you know, walking back to, the, the, to their homes from the, the Sukkot pilgrimage? We measure time by the Holy Temple. So we revel, we celebrate, we dance with joy in its, in its time of splendor, in, its, in the celebration of its dedication, and we mourn in the time of its destruction, the time leading about to its destruction, it's really all one cycle. But like I said, the month of Teve, the root of it means tov, means good. And everything is for the good. Everything that Hashem does is for the good. Every road takes us back to Hashem. And I think the beautiful thing to reflect upon regarding the month of Teve, because it is so unusual for, for a Hebrew month to begin it, smack dab in the middle of a holiday that never happens other than the month of Teve, which begins in Hanukkah. The idea is that even though this month is characterized by a certain kind of downspin, a certain kind of um, negative energy, as it were, uh, of the of the tenth of Tevet, still, still, 
it began with that light. began with the with the increase in light. It began with the with the release, the shining of the hidden light of creation during the month of Kislev, during during Hanukkah. So that is the spiritual root, as it were, of of the destruction, even as it were, because everything is about getting it better next time. Everything everything about is about getting it real and making it last forever. The rebuilding of the holy temple, and I and I think that's a nice. Um, note upon which to build and to interject the fact that over this past Hanukkah here um, in Jerusalem, we can report the tremendous increase in Jews who ascended and visited the Temple Mount during Hanukkah over last year. Statistically, it was an incredible increase. Yeah, many times more, some, I don't know, 300% or uh, 200%, uh, over a thousand Jews, well over a thousand, went up over the eight days, eight days of which I think five were actually able to go up. Uh, Non-Muslims are not allowed to go up on Fridays or on Shabbat. So uh, actually, yeah, maybe six days were able to go up. So it was a good turnout and a lot of new people. Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, it's uh, become a much more uh, pleasant and positive experience. We've reported, posted on Facebook, if you... Bizarre incidents, someone was picking up garbage the other day, putting it in a plastic bag, you know, pieces of broken glass and things, and was stopped by a policeman who basically arrested him for trying to keep the place clean. <laughs> Other person was turned away again, once again, from the water fountain. These are persistent uh, infractions, uh, violations against our rights as Jews, as human beings, well, as citizens of Israel. If, 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 if someone Israel. cries out, Shema Yisrael, right, if they'll be arrested. But yet people are succeeding in praying n more or less silently, but even rather above a whisper to themselves, even in mass, even in groups, even in a quorum, every day. So it's, it's a bit of a um, it's an evolving experience, but uh, has a lot of... Work still needs to be done, but right. it's uh, it's been positive, and we hope that it continues to be. But positive. it is an upswing, and it is and it is a national uh, momentum. National right, consensus and right, and because it's, it's a positive experience, it's much easier to encourage and convince and invite many Jews up who've never been up before, which it just increases the number, which puts more pressure on the police slash the government to uh, mend its ways and and give greater uh, equality and. Uh, like I said before, basic democratic human human rights, and of course rights as Jews to be on and pray in the holiest site there is for the nation of the Jews. So yes, look, next week we have three three days in succession, three days in Tevet, mm -hmm. and actually the next Temple Talk is scheduled for for us to broadcast actually on the fast day of, right. of Tuesday, the tenth of Tevet. But before that. There are two other days that are also uh, rather infamous uh, in our calendar. And at one time, according to our sages, when people were of a stronger constitution, um, they actually fasted all three days uh, in succession. So I refer, of course, to the 8th of Tevet and the 9th of Tevet as well, as to the 10th, which, of course, is the day of the, the siege around Jerusalem, which is, which is actually an accepted communal <coughs> fast, fast day for all of Israel. But the 8th of Tevet is a day upon which the great leaders of Israel, Ezra and Nehemiah, passed away. And that was a time of tremendous uh, tragedy for Israel because of their leadership in, in a time of uh, chaos in Jewish history and their, their, um, their direction and authority was sorely missed. The 9th of Tevet is, a, is an interesting day because that's the day that we mark as uh, a day of great tragedy. Uh, in fact, our sages tell us it's as great a tragedy as the day that uh, Israel worshipped the golden calf. I refer, of course, to the historical um, forced translation um, that, was, um, that was arranged and directed by King Ptolemy of Egypt, who forced um, 70 sages of Israel to translate the Torah into Greek the result of which is known as the Septuagint. Septuagint. And this was considered to be, to be a very uh, grave tragedy for the Jewish people, the translation of the Torah into Greek. And, of course, why should that be? When, after all, 
uh, Torah has to be accessible to all mankind. T today we have art scroll that ain't Greek. There are so many people that are studying Torah now that do not have access to the original Hebrew. And so it's, it's a blessed thing and a wonderful thing for, be, for people to be able to learn uh, Hashem's word and will in their own language. Yeah, the sages are very, very down on the Greek translation of the Torah and uh, specifically uh, liken it to the worship of the golden calf. And they even s make statements like the world was plunged into darkness when uh, the Torah was translated into Greek. I think that, that coming on the heels of Hanukkah when we, we spoke about the difference between Greek wisdom and Torah wisdom and what the whole concept of the darkness, as it were, of the Greek exile and the darkness of Greek wisdom, what it really means. And if I spoke about that, and I think that's online, the talk that we gave in America about that concept. I think this is really a natural continuation. It makes sense because everything about Greek wisdom we were talking about the intellectualism, the enlightenment of that wisdom, it's all very skin deep. It's all about demonstrative knowledge. It's about proving something and only and only believing in what can be proven and demonstrated and only believing in things that are basically have a physical manifestation. And so too, what the sages are really saying is that the Torah's translation into Greek, or, and actually, to be fair, any translation of Torah is only skin deep. And that has to be understood, that the, it's missing the soul, it's missing the inner dimension, and therefore, it is equated uh, with darkness if a person thinks that they're getting it completely. But it's so subtle and it's so, and it's so uh, totally spiritual, the, the true meaning and the true depth of what's been transmitted to Moshe. And then through the, 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 the learned men throughout all the generations, the idea is it's kind of like worshiping the golden calf because it's like you think that you're that you're really worshiping God. You think that you're that you're able to picture something, to focus on something. This is it. I have it right here in my hand. This is it. Like, oh, that's it. It's like, it's such a gross, more than over uh, oversimplification. It's a gross, you know, um, uh, mistake for a person to to think that 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 that's what God is, and so too, it's a gross mistake for a person to think that the particular translation that they're studying is what Torah really is, although it's better than nothing, I suppose, you need to get into it somehow, but there's no substitution for studying in the original, and, and when, when when one does approach Torah with a translation and let it at least be authoritative and authentic and written by God-fearing people, one still has to keep in mind that this is only a translation, and one has to endeavor to understand the nuances and the rich meaning of the original Hebrew. Can I just make a footnote, Rabbi? Please. We've talked about four different historical occurrences now, uh, starting with Hanukkah, and then uh, the death of Ezra and Nehemiah, then the translation of the Torah into Greek, and then the tenth of Tevet, which is the, the, the day that marks the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. It can be very, very confusing. You have all these highs and lows. Let's just put it in historical order, maybe make it easier. The first of these four different events that occurred historically was the, was the, the, the beginning of the siege uh, on Jerusalem by the Babylonians, which led to the destruction of the first temple and the exile to Babylon. Ezra and Nehemiah were the leaders who brought the Jews back, 42,000 Jews, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the Holy Temple. And so the eighth day marks their death. The Hanukkah then would be historically, I believe, the next event, because that's after the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple, uh, then is the after the uh, Greeks uh, occupiers defiled the temple, uh, the Hashmonian uh, warriors, Jewish warriors, were able to retake the temple and repurify it and rededicate the 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 altar. And that that's what Hanukkah is about. And that was actually towards the close of the Second Temple era. Um, yeah, it was uh, toward the close. And after that, I believe after that, is the fourth event, the translation of the Torah into, into Greek. Correct. So maybe that'll make it a little easier to wrap your heads around all these ups and downs that we're discussing right now. But the point being, again, that, that, that this is the Jewish concept of time. Yeah. These things have tremendous reverberations and ramifications and repercussions for all time, for all of us, because we are so plugged in to what the temple brings to the world, to the, to the secret of the Shekhinah dwelling amongst us, to 
the balance of um, revelation and the and the fulfillment of life that the temple introduces into the world that this is this is how our calendar works because this is where we are actually um, getting our our whole spiritual uh, nourishment from so it's blocked up right now that whole channel this is how we measure time I'm saying David is a very interesting example of the dynamic of, of time, the ups and the downs. Its its root means goodness, really, and it was born, as it were, in the, in the midst of the holiday of Hanukkah, and therefore it was inaugurated, the month was inaugurated with that light of the of Hanukkah, the light of the Holy Temple. And yet, a week later, mm-hmm. we are already beginning the process of mourning for the destruction of the Temple. True. Speaking of which, this week's Torah portion, it is... Um, Talk, speak of highs and lows. Speaking of highs and lows, <laughs> and, and also speaking of the centrality of the temple in our consciousness and everything that you want to speak about, I mean, this week's Torah portion, where do we even start? It is just a... It, is just a, um, it contains everything in the world in terms of really the microcosm of Jewish history and the themes of um, of what the Jewish people have to have to go through in this world to get to get their act together and to bring about redemption, but you know we we have here the whole idea of um, we have to start somewhere and we have so much to say about it in Parshat Vayigash, beginning of course in Genesis forty four and verse eighteen we have we have the ultimate um, uh, reunion of Yosef and his brothers led by Yehuda. Uh, the incredible um, moment when Yosef identifies himself. And I'm sorry, but I've been around a few years, and I've read this a few times, and I've learned it a few times. I'm sorry, it sucked, but I still don't understand. I cannot wrap my head around this whole scenario of suddenly them seeing that it's him and they're not having seen it before and I know that there are so many deep messages here and, and we've we've talked about this for so many years the idea of of uh, you know how you, you don't see someone that you're not expecting and how and, and and how we kind of we we block ourselves from realizing or from seeing things that we can't that we can't uh, handle and, and that kind of thing and, and all the explanations about how he didn't have a beard before and now he had a beard <laughs> but just the whole idea I mean you know, we meet people that we haven't seen in decades and they look the same and here you know it's not just that they've been talking to him but, but they were they were in, in very close quarters with him and they were also traumatized you know they were in searing difficult straits on his account i'm sure i'm sure he was his was their face that they that they saw in their nightmares mm-hmm. for weeks now and all of a sudden oh it's really yosef there's so much here there's so much here that defies the imagination could it be that they really never means. ever recognize yosef even as a young boy wow, you know wow. they just he was the dreamer they that was it. They they already knew, you know, that they didn't like him. They never really studied you're his You're saying something that I don't even know if you know how deep you're, what you're saying is. You're saying something so brilliant, in my opinion. I don't know. Are you that smart? Is this what you're saying? <laughs> Are you saying... Let's see how you explain <laughs> it. I'll <laughs> if I agree or not. To me, it sounds like you're saying that even when they were together, before, they were, before he went down to Egypt, before they sold him, did they ever really look at him? Did they ever really see who he was? Maybe that's one of the messages that the Torah is telling us here. Yeah, he was. They were blinded by their jealousy, and they, you know, they had him pegged. He's the dreamer. Cholem uh, This dreamer is coming. Let's do away with him. And and now this whole thing of how um, when the time came, and now Joseph could not restrain himself in the presence of all who stood before him. So he called it, "Remove everyone from before me." And thus, no one remained with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. You know, this whole idea of how there, there's something going on here, which is very Jewish and very much a family thing. Mm-hmm. It's very intimate. And this is not for others to be involved with or to see. And Yosef is like, obviously, certainly according to some interpretations, wants to save them embarrassment, right? Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that whole idea of like what this scene represents for the future, what this scene represents for all time, the reconciliation of, 
of the tribes of Israel and how that is not something that will be witnessed or that will be seen by anyone. How they overheard it. They did over here. They did over yeah. here. It's interesting. But but uh, what I re- actually wanted to say now, it's talk- I wanted to say something else. We, we, talk- we started talking about Tevet. We were talking about the, the, the cycle of time and the, and the passage uh, of Tevet from having started in the middle of Hanukkah and, and going from Hanukkah now to, uh, to the to the tenth of Tevet, mourning for the temple, and how everything is really about the temple. So you know, one of the most remarkable things in our parsha is that when the brothers were reunited, Yosef and Benjamin, their their reunion particularly is very, very emotional mm-hmm. and very moving because this is his brother from his mother, who he, who was not born at the time of his sale, and they have a thing, Yosef and Benjamin. Have a, no, I'm sorry. He he wasn't yeah. there though. He wasn't present. Right, he wasn't. Yeah, he I'm was sorry. Like behind. Of course, he was born, but he was not present. And they have they have some very special bond. And so we read in chapter 45 and verse two, and verse 12, excuse, and verse 14. Excuse me. That <coughs> then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. He then kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. Afterwards, his brothers conversed with him. So Yosef and, and, and Binyamin are crying on each other's neck. And uh, the Hebrew is strange. It says about Yosef, Vayipol al savare Binyamin, which literally means he fell on Benjamin's necks. This is why, by the way, the translation into Greek from the Hebrew falls short. It's just one example of, of thousands where uh, you cannot get the, the, the course, inner meaning of the Hebrew of in a course, translation. Of course, even in the art scroll, which is an authoritative translation, it says here, then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck. That's not what it says, but how are you going to write in English? He fell on his necks. They can't write that. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to learn the, the commentary but to understand. But if you look at the Hebrew, it says he fell on his necks, and Benjamin fell on his neck. So Rashi cites the words of our sages that um, Joseph... Wha, uh, wha fell on Benjamin's necks because the, t- the, t- the plural of necks represents the two holy temples that were destroyed that would be in Benjamin's territory. And when Benjamin fell on Joseph's neck, he was thinking about the tabernacle in Shiloh, which was in Joseph's territory. We'll be right back, Temple Talk. Hello and welcome back to Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Ruvain with Rabbi Chaim Richman here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the third day of the month of Tibet, 5780, 31st of December 2019. And this coming Shabbat we will be reading the penultimate Torah reading, Parsha, Parshat Vayigash, penultimate Torah reading of the book of Genesis, known in Hebrew as Breshit. And uh, we've been talking about Vayigash. Uh, Rabbi, you left us uh, on a cliffhanger about this meeting between the brothers, what it portends. So just mentioning that that uh, when um, Joseph and Benjamin met, it was it was very special because of their their um, relationship that had never really gotten off the ground before he was sold. And when they meet in chapter forty-five and verse fourteen, it des- the verse describes that they are falling on each other's neck. And weeping, and I pointed out that in the Hebrew, it states that Yosef vayipol al tzavare binyamin that he fell on Benjamin's necks in the plural, which of course doesn't make any sense in English. Benjamin only had one neck, presumably, and Benjamin fell wet wet upon his neck. And the commentaries tell us that <coughs> you could say, I suppose, to some extent, that they were not even in the moment that they were not even there because they were both of them looking into the future as if this is not enough for them right now, this moment of pathos, of reunion, of everything that it means for the family. They're actually 
had a, they had a flash, flash forward. And Joseph is weeping over the two holy temples, Batei Mikdashot, that are actually found in the tribal portion of Benjamin. The Holy of Holies is actually in the tribal portion of Benjamin. So that's the reason for the plural necks. And by the way, this comes from the Song of Songs, that the word neck there is also used to connote the Holy Temple. And in turn, Benjamin is weeping over the future destruction of the tabernacle in Shiloh, which is in the tribal portion of Joseph. So, but what, what this is really saying is that they were kind of having a transcendent moment where they saw far beyond their own personal idiom of themselves and they realized potentially who they were in terms of the spiral of Jewish history, who they were as a people. Yes, as a people, not as a religion. And they were looking into the future and, and, and already in advance mourning the, the repercussions of everything that has happened and will happen and everything that their people will have to go through. And so, and so the, meeting of, the meeting of these two great men was so far beyond anything personal. It was right. totally on a on a national level, and and because you, know, you could look at it in a very in a very uh, kind of like a cynical way, you could say what, what is Rashi saying? They're not, they're not enough in the moment. Like everything has to be extrapolated. They're not they're not thinking about themselves. No, that that's the whole point. They weren't thinking about themselves at all. They were thinking about what they mean, right. in a way. And they also realize they have this revelation of what's going to be in the future because they've reunited. Without the reunif reunification of the brothers. There is no future. Right. Uh, the future is not uh, is not just a bowl of cherries, obviously, but there is a future, and that is hope and promise, and that's you know that's the the positive outcome of all this. And then later, when when um, Yosef actually is reunited with his father, the verse tells us that Yosef was crying, but apparently uh, Jacob was not crying. Mm. And again, uh, a tradition tells us that Jacob was at that moment reciting the Shema Yisrael. Now, one, one could interpret that as being like, what, he was like so super from, like he was like so religious that he had to like, they, oh, oops, sorry, I haven't seen my son in like decades. Look, look at my watch, sorry, it's time, it's time to say Shema now. Uh, and uh, I can't, I can't uh, hug and kiss you and cry now, I have to say Shema. But I don't think that's what it means at all. I think that the, what the Torah is actually conveying to us with that thought is that Yosef was the Shema. In other words, Yaakov sees Yosef. Yosef, through everything that he had been through, through all the mutations and all the gyrations and all the incredible challenges and tests that Yosef lived through and yet remained Yosef, Ani mm -hmm. Yosef, right? He remained Yosef, right. steadfast. That's like exactly what the Shema Yisrael is. Like Hashem is one. Mm -hmm. And Yosef never forgot that. And Yosef is like the living Shema. So like ya Yaakov's basically, his reaction to seeing Yosef is to, is to turn to Hashem and say, wow, it's really true. Like you, my son, my son, proves that you are one. This is this is my thanks to you. My declaration of who Yosef is is to recite the Shema. Well, however you slice it, these meetings, this week's parsha, it is so totally replete with with just level upon level of significance and, and meaning and future meaning as well. Just as Joseph and Benjamin were crying, literally crying for the future, crying for the destruction of the temples. How fit how fit an idea uh, to reflect upon as we come into this month of Tevet and as next week already um, we'll be beginning the cycle of mourning for the destruction of the temple. That This is what they were thinking about because all roads lead to the, to the temple because all roads lead to, to the tikkun of humanity which is for all of, all of humanity to know who Hashem is which is what the temple is all about. Speaking of which, I gotta say, on another level completely Speaking of how they transcended their personal idiom and took on a, a national theme of all subsequent generations and saw themselves in the whole, in the whole prog pro progression of, of history, I can't escape this feeling, Yitzchak, that the Parsha also 
coming out now as it's coming out with everything that's going on it just speaks to me so strongly of an imprint uh, uh, set in the cosmos and a, and a pattern in time that I don't know if we've really learned from, you know, because everybody's always talking about, you know, the, the whole baseless hatred between the brothers and Yosef, and, 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 and that led them to go down to Egypt. And, of course, Hashem had already foretold to Avraham that we would have to be in Egypt and get that and get whatever tikkun that was about, get that done, and then come out of Egypt and everything, okay. But, you know, there's a certain kind of a feeling in Parshat Vayigash, a certain kind of something ominous in the background because Quite. we know what's going to happen now. We know very soon. And there's lots of foreshadowing yes. and hints in the text itself. Yes. And we know very soon that Yo- that Yosef will be forgotten. He will be the, the, the young savior, the young star who actually delivered humanity with Egypt at the apex, delivered them from annihilation and starvation with his Jewish acumen. Is that genetic? I don't know. You're not allowed to say that. Hmm. He actually will be forgotten, and his people will be enslaved and basically systematically um, targeted for genocide as well. That's what happened in the, be- mm-hmm. in, in the beginning of the book of Exodus. And this is the seeds of it right now. As Yosef comes down with Pharaoh's blessing. He brings his family with it, with its state-sponsored. Uh, pre- pre- They're uh, going uh, to the land of Goshen. Of, of 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 the chariots and and uh, and then and then this this very strange meeting between Jacob and and Pharaoh and yeah. and 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 the feeling that something is being set in, in motion now. But what it actually is 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 exile. It's yes. the process of exile. Yes. No, 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 none of, no, no Jews then, none of, none of uh, Joseph's family, none of Judah's descendants, none of the brothers, they, they didn't have any nostalgic feelings for Goshen. Right. When they, when they left there later on, they didn't have like gilded pictures or like uh, beautiful framed photographs of their homes in Goshen. They didn't bring them back with them to the, to the land of Canaan. This was a necessary stage in their spiritual development that Hashem wanted them to go through, but it wasn't something to write home about. It wasn't mm-hmm. something to be to be fond of. And so on so many levels, you know, they had a lesson to learn. It was a very deep lesson. The lesson that Judah had to learn, <coughs> the lesson that all the brothers had to learn, the lesson that Joseph had to learn, the lesson that Yaakov had to, had to learn. They all had to go through things. And now they're meeting up on foreign soil. And, they're, and they have something quite um, daunting before them that they have to go through. And the stage has been set, and this reconciliation was a, was a, a very important facet in preparation for what they will need as a, as a skill set and as a, as a toolkit for surviving in the exile. Take all that and its power and its incredible you know, spiritual um, repercussion, this whole Parshat Vayigash, take that, and for a moment, think about what is going on now in America, in New York City. It just boggles the mind. And what boggles the mind to me is not the attacks against Jews and the incredible increase in violent anti-Semitic attacks against Jews Synagogue invasions, home invasions. It's unbelievable that mm-hmm. this is happening in, 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 in New York where Jews have been comfortable and have been a vibrant part of society and have had vibrant communities and continue to do so. What, what boggles my mind is how the Jews are reacting. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm, ju- I'm just looking at a, a kind of at two tracks here. I'm looking at a parallel of Joseph and his brother's Settling down into Goshen for a long day's journey into night, literally. Right. That's what it's going to be. That's what it's going to be now. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very. It's going to very quickly turn sour and go south and become a living nightmare, a living hell, a living grave. That's yes. what it's going to be. That's what exile is. That's 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 what the whole book of Deuteronomy teaches us. Where Moshe, his, his main concern for the Jewish people when he was about to leave them, was not to forget what can happen in exile mm-hmm. and that they will be exiled as, as punishment for forgetting Hashem. And it was, never, it was never a reward. It was never supposed to be an opportunity for 
for success, for financial success, yeah. or for comfort, or anything like that. But I gotta tell you, I, I see some of the threads like on Facebook and comments that people are making about the horrible things that have happened. That you know, the the um, and, and me personally, like I'm sitting here with you now, right? It was just a few weeks ago. I was in America in the living room of a very, very dear friend, and we were watching Fox News blow by blow as it was unfolding the story of, of uh, what happened in Jersey City. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then now, what happened in Muncie, quite rural community, very rural, right? Very, yeah. very laid back. This machete attack, just unbelievable, right? And people are saying things like, well, I mean, Americans, American Jews, and American rabbis, American rabbis who really should know better, are saying things like, well, you know, saying to like us in Israel, because, you know, people are speaking up, people are speaking their minds, and getting, saying, get off your high horse kind of thing. Just because there's a terrorist attack in New York City doesn't mean that God is saying to us that we should come to Israel, just as if there would be a terrorist attack in Israel, it doesn't mean God is telling you to move to New York. And saying these things like, saying things like Jews have every right to be comfortable everywhere and to lead full Jewish lives and they have to be protected and all these kind of things, which of course I don't disagree with that they have to be protected that they, or that they should f lead full lives. But I'm not making it up. Right. Is it something in the water I'm drinking here in Israel? <laughs> Maybe. I'm not making it up. The Torah teaches us very, very specifically and emphatically that its purpose is for the Jewish people to live and I said people, as a people in their one homeland and thus to serve Hashem and bring holiness and redemption to the world. And I can tell you this is, I think, so intimately connected to the whole uh, issue of the, the, um, the, the whole contra controversial uh, um, proclamation that President Trump made that recognizes the Jewish people should be protected and legislation should be enacted to fight anti-Semitism because they are a people. Right. And the reaction to that by so many Jews was just insane. Just yes. another facet of Trump derangement syndrome that they were so <laughs> crazy. Like, how dare he call us a people? How dare he single us out as the other? He's responsible for all the anti-Semitism by calling us a people, and of course the difference between, between Trump and a reformed Jew is that his children are Jewish, his grandchildren are Jewish, <laughs> excuse me. But, um, ouch. ouch, I know I'm not yes. allowed to say those ouch. kind of things, but I could care less. But the thing is, it's like, well, it's true, and we've been saying this for years, we've been teaching it for years, it's the Torah, it's the truth of the Torah. Why did Hashem tell Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm going to in, I'm gonna make you into a great right. nation. Bring you down to Egypt, make you into a great nation. That was the whole point. And, yes. and, and, and aren't we reading it in, in, about how Yaakov and his family came? It's a family. The thing is, as soon as you say that it's a religion, and I understand full well, full well the position of American Jews, because as soon as you say that it's a religion, well, you can practice a religion anywhere. Mm -hmm. you, you can be comfortable anywhere. You can build a synagogue. You can light candles. You can keep Shabbat and, anywhere. And you can be but a good if, American. And you can be a good American. But if you're a people, <laughs> there's a problem, because a people belongs somewhere. A people belong somewhere. And this is why they are so, some Jews are so furious and they refuse to consider it. And, he, and they say, oh, that's anti-Semitic to say that we're a people. What? What? That is like the truest thing that Trump ever said is that we <laughs> yes. are a people. Of course we are a people. What did you think? What did you think? You know, so, we, so, we, also so, recall, we also recall that when uh, Israel left Egypt, that was only, you know, some some of the sages say it was only one out of five uh, Israelite, you know, Hebrew who actually left. The other ones were content uh, where they were, despite all the oppression and uh, anti-Semitism, as it were, to, um, right. that day. So it's very tragic. It's very, very tragic uh, to see people who are so embedded, uh, you know, in their where they are that they can't see the the forest through the trees they're they're just all twisted up first of all it's such a horrible thing that's going on it's so it's so um absolutely frightening and and then you hear jews saying that they are frightened and frightened of, of outwardly dem demonstrating their their judaism this is a, a very horrible thing and um it's really 
again, pathetic, the reaction of some Jewish organizations who are saying that, oh, it's all about education, and then and some Jewish organizations are saying, well, if we pour millions of dollars into the New York City public school system, then they'll all love us. The children will learn to love us. That is just so, so ridiculous. That's not the priority. The priority is to, is to come home to Israel where you belong. And, and people are going to be very angry at us for saying this as well, but like, this does, none of this makes any sense. I mean, God forbid that something horrible should happen, and, we, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't have a moment's peace over what's going on and, and, and the terrible travail that, that our brethren are facing. But will they wake up and understand that they do not belong there? And then, and then when they say things like, oh, you know, there's no attacks in Israel, there's no anti-Semitism in Israel, you know what? All I can tell you is exactly what Rabbi Akiva told Papus ben Yehuda, the story in Masechet Brachot, when uh, Rabbi Akiva, the, the Romans made a decree against publicly, publicly teaching Torah. And Rabbi Akiva still gathered groups in, pub, in public mm-hmm. and large groups, and he taught them Torah. And... Uh, and so he was asked, aren't you afraid uh, to do this? Aren't you afraid you'll be caught by the Romans and, and, uh, and put to death? And he said, I'll, I'll tell you a parable. It's like the fox was walking along the banks of the river, and he mm-hmm. sees the fish in the river, and he says to the fish, you want to come up here on dry land and live with me in peace? And the fish say, you're supposed to be the wisest of all, the kind, most cunning of all the animals, if in the water we're afraid because of the hooks that people put into the water to catch us. Don't we have much more to be afraid of on dry land where we, this is not our natural habitat? So, so this Israel is where we belong. It's the land that Hashem gave us. It's, it's connected to us on a soul level. It's connected to the Torah on a soul level. It's connected to Hashem on a soul level. This is where we belong. Anything else is an aspect of punishment and death. No matter how comfortable you are, no matter how beautiful your home is, no matter how good your job is, no matter how much money you have in the bank, no matter how great your schools are, no matter how great your kashras organizations are, you are not supposed to be there. And so if, yes, you're right, there are problems here in Israel, but come here and help us fix it. And that's, that's the message. That's, that's that's, that's the message. That's, that's going to make all the difference the in the world. That's the message of Yosef and Benjamin when they fell on each other's necks. Uh, yes, there's going to be problems, but those problems are going to be in the land of Israel where we belong. They were not celebrating uh, their new life, you know, in the golden of Medina where everything's going to be great. You know, the new America, Egypt was, the, was America then. It was the big, most powerful, most prosperous country in the world. No, they were understanding that the future lies in Israel, and it's yes, there terrifying. are tragedies, but our future is here. It's terrifying what's going on in America. I am so much more concerned, terrified, gripped with anxiety over the plight and the future of American Jews than I am of us and our own children here in the land of Israel, where we belong and where we will make a difference and where we will see, ultimately, the unfolding of the redemption as it already has begun, because unfortunately, all the diaspora communities ultimately are going to be nothing more than a blip on the timeline of Jewish history because it doesn't matter because it's inconsequential because it's not what God had in mind because it's not where we belong because there is no future there whatsoever and and I and I beg and plead with the almighty to to allow our people to wake up and to help them to understand that the, that their future is here in the land of Israel and that's if there's one thing that we understand from what's happening here in the progression between Parshat Vayigash and the next few Torah portions and to, and, and to what it all begins with in, in, in Parshat Shemot where we'll see the, or, the organized genocide of the Jewish people where they, where they were d- deliberately killed, this is, this is what it leads to. And of course, it's not simply recorded in the books of Genesis and, and Exodus, but in our history, uh, Jews have... Uh, felt very much at home in different countries around the world, different societies, and have risen to the top and have become very prominent and felt like they are uh, one of the one of the people, and they're very uh, patriotic and, uh, and believe in their host countries. And then the darkness comes, and it happened in Spain, it happened in Poland, it happened in Germany, it happened in many, many places. Uh, as high as you rise to the top... Uh, there's going to be a fall. That just is the nature of the ex- of the exile game. That's the way it works. Anyway, I'll I'll just say it one more time for all the listeners who aren't going to ever want to listen to us again. But <laughs> Judaism is not a religion. There is no Judaism. There is no Jewish religion. There is a Jewish people, and a people have a homeland and a language and a way of life. And our way of life is the Torah. Our covenant is with Hashem. It's based on the commandments. We are a people. A people belong somewhere. And that is all the difference in the world. So Kolokovod, kudos to President Trump for pointing that out. We are a people. 
And uh, he pointed it out in order to help to defend Jewish lives in the United States. Somehow that got twisted. Exactly. Around to see the exact He's being opposite accused of the whole problem. But again, uh, it's a reality check for, for Jews around the world. That, uh, yes, as you said, we're a nation, we have a God, we have a covenant with that God called the Torah, and we have a land that God bequeathed to us for all time, and that is here at the land of Israel, and that's where Jews belong. Uh, and that is our reality. And when you're outside of that reality, you're on borrowed time, and as Moshe Rabbeinu, as Moses said, in a, in a strange land, Sorry, guys. You have been listening to Temple Talk. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Happy month of Tevet, and may we all be reunited soon Here. in the land of Israel. Amen. Temple to Talk. happily ever after. Temple Talk.